We're going to start this puppy up. Clear? Prop? And welcome back to Tip of the Week. Regardless of the type of engine your aircraft has, whether it's a Continental, Lycoming, Rotax, all sorts of engines, and whether it's air-cooled or water-cooled, what they all have in common is they need to report their engine temperatures accurately back to you. And that's what we're going to talk about this time, how we take temperature measurements from your engine. So why do we even care about monitoring engine temperatures? Well, for peace of mind. We would love to have some advance warning if the thing is about to overheat. Mechanical problems can cause overheating. What better way to keep an eye on the health of a running engine than to monitor temperatures? And then what about tuning? When you go grab that mixture control to try and get the last bit of power out of that engine, you're staring at an exhaust gas temperature gauge trying to get it right at peak or right before peak or right after peak, whatever. But monitoring temperatures is critical to an aircraft engine and you need to see what's going on. So specifically, what is it that we want to measure temperature-wise on our engine? We have oil temperature, we have our cylinder head temperature, we have our exhaust gas temperatures, we also could have coolant temperature, if so equipped, and even the outside air temperature. Here's a display from my Continental O200 engine. This is an air-cooled four-cylinder. Notice that although this is electronic, it certainly could have been an analog gauge display. But what's nice about this is we can see the allowable ranges of temperatures, so we know what's normal and maybe a little bit abnormal. Here's my oil temperature of 80 degrees. Now, you can probably tell this engine was just started not too long ago. And then down at the bottom, I'm measuring temperatures individually for each of the four cylinders, the exhaust gas temperature coming out of the cylinder and also the cylinder head temperature. So just how are temperatures within our engine measured and then relayed up to our display? Well, nine times out of ten, it's done with a device called a thermocouple. Now, here are some pictures of some very common ones that are used within our aircraft engines. Let's talk about how they work. In 1821, a German physicist made a discovery. He found that when he joined two wires together, as long as the wires were made out of different metal alloys and then heated the junction, a magnetic compass situated near the wires would deflect. And it was from then, and additional discoveries, it was determined that the junction of two dissimilar metals produce a tiny voltage based on the temperature at that junction. That is the basis of thermocouples. That is the thermocouple, the junction of two dissimilar metals. And then by measuring the voltage that is induced, the tiny voltage, we can figure out what the temperature is at that junction. Here is a modern day device for reading thermocouples, the temperatures that is. Here is my thermocouple. It has two prong plug at one end and it's about a four foot wire at the other end is kind of hard to see there but is a junction between the two thin wires 
that are inside. Take a look. Those are the two wires that are simply bonded at the end. They're either soldered or twisted. It doesn't matter. But at that junction, that is the thermocouple where the two wires join together. Now I'm going to plug the thermocouple into the top. There we go. And you will notice 66 degrees Fahrenheit. That's basically the room temperature here. Remember the thermocouple is the junction between the two wires. There are two dissimilar wires inside of this blue sheath. I'm going to breathe on this tip. So I am full of hot air. But you will notice all it takes to read a thermocouple is an inexpensive device like this. Now this is more than just a voltmeter because before the two conductors of non-similar metals goes into the box, we have to take another temperature measurement in order to compensate for the voltage. In other words, we have a junction here and we have a junction where it goes into the meter. If we know the temperature here, which we do, this has a built-in thermometer, then we can determine the temperature here by measuring the voltage on the line. So let's look at other thermocouples that don't look quite like this one does. If we can use any two dissimilar metals to create a thermocouple, does it matter which ones we use? And the answer is yes. By national standards, we can use what the engineers have already tested and come up with tables and charts so that we have predictable results for predictable temperatures. In other words, the K-type, the most common, defines that the two metals we are to use in our thermocouple are chromal and alumo. And these two alloys should be covered in a yellow and red jacket so that we can identify them more easily. There are other types of thermocouples, the J type, the S type, and there's a whole bunch of other ones. Those use different metal alloys and of course will have different voltage curves given different temperatures. Some of them have wider ranges of heat, in other words very very hot or very very cold, etc. But the K type is the most common. But always check your package before purchasing one because the instrument that reads it needs to understand which type you have so that it interprets the little voltages given off by the thermocouple and translates them into the proper temperature reading in degrees centigrade or Fahrenheit. So here's one example of a popular thermocouple. Notice the plug. This is becoming well, has been a standard for type K thermocouples. Two blades, one blade is larger than the other because remember, it matters which is the uh, alumel and the chromel wires if you're going to connect it to a device. You can't swap it, that would be no good. And then, of course, the other end. Now, I had always wondered I was going to cut one of these apart and find out what's inside a thermocouple that makes it work. And now we know, right? It's just two wires that come together and touch, join inside this. That's all it is. Kind of makes you feel funny paying 30 40 50 60 dollars for one of these when you know what's inside. And I always wondered about these. Right, cylinder head temperature, put that under a spark plug, and I'm like, wow, I wonder how they make this work. And again, two wires that come together 
and of course are also bonded to the ring for the heat transfer and the plug. Now, what's nice about these plugs is oftentimes you need to extend these, right? This one is only a foot long. So what if our reading instrument is many feet away? You would like to extend these with an extension cord of some type. Well, here's your two contacts. Well, the easiest thing is to go out and buy some plugs. Here's a pair of males. Here's a pair of females. You can get these at Amazon. Type K miniature plugs. And you simply put the wire in there. It comes apart with two screws. Again, male and female. Now here's my question. What type of wire are you going to use if you want to extend your thermocouple for another how many feet you want? If you build one of these connectors and attach regular wire, copper wire, what do you think is going to happen? Well, you know about thermocouples now, right? Copper is different than alumel or chromel. If you plug a copper wire cable into this, you will have another new junction. And what will that do? That will create some minute voltages. What does that mean? It means the reading on your meter will be wrong. So what do you want to do? You want to build an extension cable as long as you want, but what type of wire do you want to use? If you're going to build a plug so that you can plug into this, the wires you want to use are, if this is a type K thermocouple, which it is, you want to continue the chromel wire with chromo and the alumel wire with alumel. So in other words, to build a proper extension cable, you need to get yourself some more of the alumel and chromel wire. Well, guess what? Just go to Amazon, buy it. This is basically a spool of, and they just call it type K wire, because we know the standard, ANSI standard for type K is alumel and chromel wire. And again, the color coding, the alumel is the red, the chromel is the yellow, and that way you can cut off as much or as little of this as you want for your extension cable. Put on a male connector and a female at the other end, and now you can extend this all the way up to your instrument. So the moral of the story is if you're going to build extensions, go right ahead. Just don't use copper wire. If you use copper wire, the thing will still work, but the readings will be wrong. I wanted to talk about this wonderful, inexpensive meter. This was less than $30 at, uh, from Amazon, and its purpose in life is to read thermocouples. Now, it's currently set up for a type K. It is two channel. Now, what that means is right now there's nothing red. I'm going to grab the thermocouple, the one with the probe that we just looked at, and I'm going to plug it into the top. It can only go one way. One of the blades is wider than the other. That's so that you don't get the polarity wrong. In other words, the chromel wire has to go in the chromel, the alumel has to go into the alumel, push that in, and immediately, as you notice, it reads the temperature, 66 degrees. I will grab the other one, that, uh, the other thermocouple, and plug that into the top also. And notice we immediately get it to read. So this is a two-channel. So I can read two thermocouples at the same time, confirm they're working. I can switch between centigrade and it's hard to read centigrade and Fahrenheit. I can also change the type of uh, thermocouple. We want uh, type. Right? If you read, you probably can't see that. There's the type number. I don't think I was even on K there. There you go, type K. So this will read other types of thermocouples we want, okay. Um, and that's basically its, 
importance. We can also do the difference between those two. I don't have any use for that. But the purpose for this in our experimental airplanes is that, number one, you can quickly test thermocouples to make sure they're working. And you can also verify that they're within the right range, dunking something into uh, ice water, right? That should go down to 32 Fahrenheit, things like that. Um, but also, if you are, like, I'm going to be starting up an engine for the first time, and I don't want to have the complete panel all wired up, etc. I do want to test my EGTs and CHTs. So with one meter, I can monitor both simultaneously, and then when I'm done, disconnect and reconnect to the cable that goes uh, to, to the rest of the instruments. So I just find this extremely useful um, for testing and troubleshooting all sorts of temperature probes. Another example might be if I build an extension to one of these and I want to test out that the extension is in fact not changing the temperature because I didn't have them backwards or was using the wrong type of wire or whatever the case may be. Well, that's it for Thermocouples 101. But what a phenomenal natural occurrence to be able to bring two dissimilar metals together, apply heat, and magically a voltage appears. That's Mother Nature doing a lot of magic there. The thermocouple itself, that's easy to build now that we understand it. So in the meantime, see you next time and back to building.